secret plan to build a television-based reconnaissance satellite. Lockheed, the prime contractor, had made considerable progress designing a spacecraft called the Agena that would carry the TV camera into orbit. But Dr. Land, who stepped in to review the effort, decided that 117L was years away from delivering crystal clear pictures. Remembering the powerful optics of Levison's balloon camera, Land convinced Eisenhower that his new goal should be to put a similar camera into space, let it take pictures, then bring the exposed film back down to Earth for developing. The Thor rocket and the upper stage Agena spacecraft developed for 117L would be retooled for this new mission. It was a bold, quick, and relatively cheap solution. Eisenhower said yes, and a new satellite was born. It was given the code name Corona. I was called into my boss's office, and he basically said, Jim, um, I'm going to give you a new assignment, which was a bit of a disappointment because I was had the responsibility for the payload and all of, most of the applications of this WS-117L, and I liked the job. I didn't want another job, but he says, we want you to go underground. And that, to me, after I found out more about it, was he wanted me to go off and head a covert program, a truly uh, solid, need-to-know program uh, that could tell no one. The task facing Lockheed's engineers was daunting. At a time when American rockets could barely get off the ground, they had to put a finely calibrated machine into outer space and control its actions once it got there. The goal was to put a corona satellite into polar orbit around the Earth. Once there, the satellite's camera would be turned on and off as areas of interest passed by underneath. The capsule needed to be stable on all three axes. In other words, instead of spinning like a top, it had to stay level like an airplane or a balloon, always keeping its lens pointed at the Earth. Corona's film would spin from the back of the satellite, through the camera, and into a take-up reel crammed into the nose of the spacecraft. When all the film was exposed, the spacecraft would eject a bucket filled with spy film back down to the Pacific Ocean. To carry off this high-risk plan, Eisenhower again turned to the CIA. Richard Bissell, now a rising star at the agency following the success of the U-2, added Corona to his list of responsibilities. Bissell applied the same tight security restrictions here that he established for the U-2. For Air Force coordination, Bissell turned to General Osmond Ritland, his deputy on the U-2 program. Ritland set up a covert or black Corona office, then hid it inside a mild-mannered space research program called Discoverer. Colonel Lee Battle ran the day-to-day -day operations of the so-called Discoverer program. At first, only Battle, his deputies, and one office worker knew the satellite's secret identity. I was official United States Air Force secretary. The engineering stuff went right over my head, but I knew that I never mentioned NRO, I never mentioned CIA, I never mentioned any of these things in any conversation. I couldn't, wouldn't even use the word black. Black program, you know, what's that? The skunk works. You just never said those things. You have to be introduced to everybody before you do any talking. Like if I was introduced to you and I knew that you had been briefed, but I hadn't been introduced to you as this is so-and-so who's briefed on the Corona program, I could never discuss Corona with you. A crash development program was set into motion. The goal was to begin launching satellites by 1959, less than a year away. Rocket engines were tested, and recovery capsules endured punishing trials to see if their delicate payloads would survive the shock of re-entry and splashdown. Meanwhile, Air Force pilots tried to learn one of the most challenging maneuvers in aviation history, catching recovery buckets as they floated down on parachutes. The public and most of the people who worked on the project were told that the Discoverer program's mission was scientific testing. 
These astro mice were part of the deception. Discoverer was supposed to put them and a few monkeys into outer space. That never happened. But sometimes the satellite was used for legitimate research. When launches began, the secret Corona team often played a shell game, swapping in a science payload for a spy camera at the last moment. This cloak and dagger game frustrated the medical researchers, none of whom were briefed on the secret mission. Lockheed built the spacecraft, but a company called iTech built its contents, the first space-based spy camera. iTech was co-founded by reconnaissance expert Richard Leghorn, a veteran of Operation Crossroads. One of iTech's key employees was Walter Levison, the designer of the 461L balloon camera. Now Levison and a team of engineers wrestled with the challenge of building a precision instrument that could function in outer space. What you want to do is to optimize the camera. The easiest thing in the world is to throw too much camera at a problem. And that means you put too long a focal length on it or too wide an aperture. And so it becomes important to be able to optimize the solution to the problem as opposed to throw the biggest camera you can fit into the space at the problem. Uh, you can put enough camera in there so it would never get off the ground. I think uh, anyone who n knows anybody about a camera is the worst thing that can happen is that you move the camera when you're taking a picture. And the and basically the problem is the same up there. While you are taking the picture, everything has to be standing still as far as you're concerned. Now, you take into account the fact that you are going 18,000 miles an hour through the area by what they call image motion compensation. And that's basically tracking the image with the, uh, with the camera system. But uh, some changes can be so subtle, you can't really identify what you've done. But if it works out, you better leave it alone and stick with it. This elaborate maze of lights and miniatures is iTech's model room, where engineers test the sharpness of their optics. Since the days of Corona, lenses have been locked into this ceiling and pointed down at tiny targets. This system can replicate any possible angle of the sun at any time of the day or of the year. With a few minor adjustments, technicians can see exactly what a camera will see from outer space. But at first, no one was certain the Corona satellite would actually work. In the early days of spaceflight, basic questions about rocket science and optical physics hadn't been answered. For instance, could a camera survive being shot into space? If it survived and took pictures, would it be able to see through the Earth's atmosphere? Would the vacuum of space play havoc with the satellite's delicate parts? Would any of a hundred other things go wrong? The answer to all of these questions was yes. If things could go wrong, they did go wrong. is the center of America's secret space program. Since the mid-1950s, thousands of rockets have blasted off from Vandenberg's 55 launch sites. Corona was just the first of a long line of classified payloads this base has shot into orbit. But Vandenberg is not the ideal location for a high security launch site. It's often cold and foggy here. For several decades, a passenger train ran right through the base. Still, Vandenberg is in the right position to send satellites into the north to south orbits favored for spying. The base is situated on a remote tract of land next to the Pacific Ocean. A handy thing if you're worried about dud rockets crashing down on civilian heads. And in the 1950s and early 60s, 
rockets crashed more often than not. Any failure that occurred in space, other than the Challenger blow-up, we did first. We failed in a marvelous bunch of different ways. Uh, we were always unhappy for the first 24 hours or so after a failure until we figured out what had happened, and then we went off and launched another, fixed it, and went off and launched another one. One that gets no publicity at all is what I call Discover Zero. And that was our very first launch, our first launch attempt. And we had the thing sitting on the launch pad, and we'd gone through the countdown. And, and we'd been very careful in the preparation to test everything, to make sure everything worked right. And we pushed the automatic sequencer, and about 30 seconds later, technical hold. And what had happened was that there was a sneak circuit, and when we pushed the automatic sequencer, there were some little bitty rockets up on the, the Gina that were supposed to, to separate the Agena essentially from the Thor, and they fired. And they were supposed to fire when the Thor had burned out and you were up almost in orbit. And here we are still hooked up to the launch pad, and these things fire. Uh, it's not very good practice. The next one we launched, Everything goes great. Yep, it takes off and everything is fine. This is Discoverer 1. And so the Air Force holds a big press conference and says Discoverer 1 is in orbit. Unfortunately, the tracking stations never hear it, nor does anybody else. But we've already said it's in orbit. And then we go back and look at the facts, and the facts are that our tracking station got only about half of the Agena burn, so it could only track it halfway and, it, and assumed that since everything was right halfway, everything continued to be right the rest of the way. Well, that's a bad assumption. And so we learned that you never say you're on orbit until you get acquisition at a tracking station. So we spent three weeks trying to prove that it went in orbit, and I'm convinced that, well, I signed the report that said it went in orbit, but I'm really convinced that it went in the South Pacific. Discover 2, we thought everything was going great. We made a mistake at the tracking station in uh, Kaina Point. They misset the timer, and it was very easy to do. And we never could talk to it again because we were, we were very paranoid about the Russians taking control of the satellite, so we only turned on the comm system when it was supposed to be in range of a tracking station. So it's gone. And so all we can do is sit there and say, where is this thing going to come down? By studying the capsule's trajectory, the Corona team guessed that the film pod would land near the Arctic territory of Spitsbergen, perilously close to the USSR. Did Discoverer 2 really go down in Spitsbergen? Uh, a bunch of guys jumped on an airplane and flew to Norway, and they were going to go out and see if they could find it. There was no way to get from Norway to Spitsbergen. There was no landing field on Spitsbergen that was big enough. So they flew over and they saw a lot of tracks in the snow and they said, oh, that must have been the Russians getting the capsule. Luckily, Discoverer 2 didn't carry a camera. The mission payload was a pair of artificial mice, part of the biomedical cover story. Launches continued at the rate of two every other month. The rocket scientists and their military overseers were slowly inventing the craft of space travel and suffering failure after failure along the way. We were very primitive. And sometime later, we, we blew up one. And the failure analysis 